kind of hard this early. But we're doing good. I want you to turn in your Bibles and find uh, Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to be looking at the account of the Magi as they made their way to Jerusalem. And looking at some of the issues there. So as we do that, you find that Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Gathering together all the chief priests, scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, For this is what has been written in the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. For after hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. So we'll stop there and pray. Father, thank you for the word of Scripture this morning, the things that that we can learn from it, things that we can see in it, and pray that you would transform our hearts and lives, Lord, by the word of God, the hearing of your word preached. Lord, would you speak to us today in a very special way? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, as we enter into this passage of Scripture, it says Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and we know that. Oh, we sing that little hymn, O town of, O little town of Bethlehem. Bethlehem in the days of Herod the king. And it's interesting that, that God did something really special. I mean, of all the places that Jesus could have been born, he was born in Bethlehem. I mean, it seems like, well, why not Jerusalem? It's the center of all religious activity for the nation. Seemed like that'd been a really good place for it. Or why not in Rome? I mean, the center of the empire. I mean, man, when he appeared, then then everyone would know about it. And then as you think about uh, maybe Athens, uh, the center of learning, uh, what a great place because he is what? Truth. So, I mean, it, it's interesting how God does things because a lot of times it's in an unexpected way. And all of a sudden we find here some people arriving in Jerusalem. And their question is, where is this king who has been born, the king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. You know, that's a good question. Where is he? It happened on the south side of Chicago. Thirty-two baby Jesuses were stolen out of people's nativity scene. 
And then on Saturday morning, a lady awoke and they were all lined up against her fence. She said it was quite a sight and very shocking when she went outside and there were 32 little baby Jesuses lined up on her fence. And so she thought about what she should do with them. So the only thing she knew to do was take them down to her church and give them to the pastor. Well, the pastor calls the police, and the police come, and, and they're able to get about uh, 14 of them uh, located, you know, and immediately people come and pick up their Jesus so they can put him back in Christmas. But then the police put out a bulletin and says, if you're looking for Jesus, you can find him down at that church. You know what the question is. When people come here looking for Jesus, will they really find him? Will they find the people who know him and be able to share with them what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ? See, that's what Christmas is all about, is is that God himself came in the flesh to reveal himself and, and to serve in himself as our Savior and our Lord. The world is going about their business just like it says Herod and, and, and all his gang. It says, when Herod heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. You know, they, they didn't know what to make of this. Here comes somebody and they're asking, where is the king of the Jews? Well, Herod's going, well, I thought I was. Little did he know. And sometimes little do we know. That we're not necessarily the center of our own universe. We're not only... We're not the ones supposed to be sitting on the throne of our hearts and lives. Well, there's one who is known as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's his rightful place. But it's kind of interesting that, that when we talk about the coming of Christ, where is he who has been born King of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. See, Matthew, Matthew's really a special gospel because he's writing it to the Jews and you'll notice even in this passage of scripture he quoted one of the prophets who spoke about Bethlehem being the place of birth. But he does that over and over again in the gospel of Matthew. Why? Because he's writing to the Jewish people and he's wanting them to understand the connection in the Old Testament with the prophets and the way God was moving and working that they ought to be looking for the Messiah, that they ought to be looking for this king. And he makes that connection for them. God's very intentional on that. Can you imagine? These are Gentiles. These are people miles and miles away from the event. And God provides them a witness that unmistakably informs them. I mean, without any question, they, they know that, that this was a supernatural event that only God could put together. And they began to say, well, let's go and find him. And here they come to Jerusalem looking for this one who is the king of the Jews. Why? Notice what they said. Because we have saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. We live in a world that seems to think God is a multiple choice thing. But the God of creation is the God of our salvation. He's the author and finisher of our faith. And people question that and people re re reject that and, and rebel against that and, and try to argue against that. But yet, Scripture tells us that God himself, the one who created, the one who sustains, the one who's going to bring it all to an end in the, at the right time, that he bears witness of his son. 
They saw that star in the east and they have come to worship him. Now as I think about King Herod, that word troubled, <laughs> that's interesting, isn't it? That here comes these guys looking for the king and all of a sudden he's troubled. Why? He don't want to be unseated, number one. And he was a ruthless man. You may know that, that he uh, executed members of his family. Uh, I mean, he was just a ruth, ruthless guy. And he was going to hang on to his power and his position no matter what. And we see him in this chapter going to some real excruciating extremes, I guess would be a way of describing that trying to hold on to what he's got. But that brings into question again for us. How often do we cling to what's ours and what's mine, my authority, my perspective, all of that, rather than yielding to what God wants to do and how God sees it, what God's trying to accomplish. To be honest with you, we're all a little bit self-centered, amen? <laughs> we all got our own perspective, and, and then we excuse ourselves, well, that's just the way I, what? That's just the way I am. But God's got a better plan. God's got a better idea. And that's why we call him King, Jesus. So when Herod heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And see, that speaks of human nature more than just the personality. I mean, he, was, he wasn't anybody to admire at that point. But then stop and think about it. It says, all Jerusalem with him. And that calls into, for us, our human nature and our desire to be the one who pulls ourselves up by our bootstraps. We call ourselves the self-made man, and, and we want to call our own shots, and we want to make our own decisions and go our own way. And somebody wrote a song and said, I did it my way, not God's way. So this morning when this little baby comes and becomes our Savior and Lord and, and his rightful place, Sometimes it's hard to let go. I remember when my son and his wife decided they were going to be missionaries in the Dominican Republic. Um, they had to sell their house, two cars, a boat, all their furniture. And they got rid of all that in order to go to the Dominican Republic. And he had a, I don't know what, he, I guess a blog is what you would call it. The title of it was this, Unclenched Fist. You see, sometimes we hang on to the back of the pew, hang on to our stuff, hang on to our rights, hang on to everything that's mine, so hard to unclench our fist. But let me tell you something. There's a God that you can trust that much. There's a God that you can know and understand that he is good and loving, gracious and merciful, and kind, patient, gentle. That when you unclench those fists, he's got stuff to put in your hand. He's got stuff that will fill up your life. He's got blessings that will come that you know not of. For he is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Remember that? Old King James. And so as we think today about the, 
just how everyone was bothered by this idea that there could be another king. Sometimes we're bothered by that. But it's because we know that we are to live our lives in response to his authority and his place in our lives. I want you to write this passage of scripture down. It's found over in Romans chapter 14. Verse 7. For not one of us lives for himself and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Wow. <laughs> now, that's an amazing passage of Scripture, isn't it? And what it declares to us. Romans chapter 14, verse 7 and following. It's one of those passages of scriptures that today we have to consider why because King Herod had a problem with this new king coming in and and sometimes we got a problem when we find that we can't call the shots like we want them to. But just remember this. There is a God and you're not him. We have to remember that sometimes. So notice verse 4. At least they knew enough to look. Gathering together all the chief priests, scribes, and the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will be a shepherd of my people. You know, Bethlehem teaches us something. That God can take a little and make a lot. I mean, when you stop and think about all the stuff that went on in Bethlehem, Ruth ended up there. David was discovered there as God led the prophet Samuel to him. Um, I mean, just all sorts of things in the Old Testament ended up in Bethlehem. But the most amazing thing was the one who was going to be the shepherd of his people was born there. Jesus Christ. So then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. Folks, do you know when that there are people who pretend to be religious? There are people who play the role and can put on a good act. But here's the sad thing. God knows their heart. And you may low notice in this passage of Scripture After hearing the king, it says they went, they went. But then verse 12, notice. Having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left their own country by another way. See, I have to look myself in the mirror, and I have to ask you to look in the mirror of God's word and say, be certain that we're not just going through the motions and be certain that we're not just doing, playing the game. I mean, I want to be a good Baptist, right? So I walk the aisle and I get baptized and, and I give a tithe and I go to Sunday school and I check off my little boxes, you know, on my 
envelope, and, and so I'm, I'm okay. No, no. God looks at the heart, and he understands our motive. He understands what's really first in our life. He understands where he fits into our life. And he really understands how he wants us to be a part of his kingdom. So it's never too much to ask that we examine our hearts today. And out of love, come to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords. Sing praises to him. Give glory to him. Allow him to be first priority in our lives. Just what kind of king do we serve? Well, the scripture said he's the king of kings, lord of lords. <laughs> he's the one who calls the shots. He's the one who holds it all together. But sometimes I wonder if we don't treat him more like a parliamentary king or royalty. Y'all remember Queen Elizabeth before she died? She was a figurehead of England. Lots and lots of influence. Lots and lots of tradition. But as far as impacting the daily life of the people of England, she didn't do that. The prime minister was the one impacted their lives the most in Parliament. But she was a figurehead. And even though people said that they loved her, adored her, and honored her as the Queen of England, there really wasn't any other responsibility. And I think sometimes it's easy for us to treat Jesus like that. Oh, yeah, I know he died on the cross, and I know he sits at the right hand of the Father, but, but he really has no impact on the way I live. I go to church, and I dress up, and I sing, and I do all the stuff, you know, to, to make sure people know that I know. <laughs> but sometimes we don't know what he knows. And even said it in the Scripture. There are people who honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's a scary thought when you, when you really come to, to think about it, that God can see through all of that. But when we recognize him as our Lord and our King, man, he begins to shape and mold and direct our lives. Why? Because whether we live or whether we die, we, we belong to the Lord. He bought us with his precious blood, not silver and gold. And as Paul said, because of that, glorify him in your body. And what a great day to be reminded. Because Herod was having a terrible time with it. <laughs> he just couldn't accept it. And then we stop and think about what he did. Matthew 16 says, When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were born in Bethlehem in its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. And then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Can you imagine a parent that point, the soldiers come busting in and grab your child, and the rest is history. Why? Herod didn't want to let go. He didn't want to unclench his fist. He didn't want to receive 
the one who has rightful place. When we disobey God sometimes, it's really in our hearts what we're saying. God, I wish you didn't exist. Because I don't like what you tell me. <laughs> I don't want to do what you've asked. I want to live by your standards. I got my own. And I want to make my own plan. Folks, do you understand? That's the worst kind of idolatry. Because we set ourselves up as God, yet we're allowing him to be Lord. We can learn a lot today from old King Herod. It's messed up as he was. But it shows us a lot about human nature and that problem called sin that's got the capital I in it, not the word. But I don't want to end on that note. Because <laughs> we met some men that came into Jerusalem and they were, they were on the right track. They saw a star. They came looking for the king. Y'all remember the verse quoted last night, and I quoted it before to you. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. It says, you'll search for me and find me when you seek for me with all your heart. And they came looking. They came searching. They came to find this one that they knew was the king of the Jews. Notice what it says about them. Herod sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. When you find him, come back, and so that I might come worshiping here, worshiping also. And after hearing the king, it says, They went their way. And notice this God is still revealing himself. It says, The star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And coming into the house, they saw the They got to be included in that, and, and all of a sudden there they were before him, and, and, and all they could do was fall down and worship him. I mean, wasn't this, hey, well, that's a cute baby you got there. Man, look, he kind of resembles you. He's got a likeness. Look how cute he is when he smiles and grins and gurgles. No, no, no. They saw something there that God revealed to them, and it says they fell down and worshipped him. One of the greatest privileges we have is to come and worship the living God. We want to do that this morning and open our hearts to all that he wants for us. If he lives for us, lives in us, lives with us, and one day we'll be with him face to face. Amen? That's a good deal. I want you to stop and think for just a moment, though. Christopher Hibbert wrote a biography of King George III. And in that biography, he told about uh, King George's habit when he would escape the confines of London and he journeyed to his home at Windsor Castle. And while he was there, he would take off on long walks, not tell anybody that he was leaving. He'd just slip out the side door and go and wander and walk and visit and, and just be by himself. 
And he would often surprise his neighbors by popping into their home. Can you imagine? It's the king. <laughs> Grab the peanut butter. Do you like crunchy or smooth? <laughs> you know, uh, whatever it might be, but, but he's come over. And, and it tells about an occasion where he popped into one of those neighbors' places. He walked into a barn where a woman was milking the cows. And she had no idea that he was the king. So George asked her, where's all the other laborers and farm workers? Where had they gone? <laughs> she said, well, they all went to see the king. She was a little frustrated by that. She said, I wouldn't give a pen to see him beside the fools lose a whole day's work, and that is more than I can afford to do, and I have five children to work for. Now, she's talking to the king, okay? But here's what the king did. Listen to this. He took some coins from his pocket, gave them to her, and he said, well then, you may tell your companions who were gone to see the king that the king came to see you. You know what's precious about that? Is that our king left heaven's throne and came to see us and revealed him. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace, full of truth. Hey, folks, we can tell our friends and our neighbors, our co workers. You may be looking for the king, but the king has come to see us. His name is Jesus. God had it planned out all from the beginning of time. So we would know him, love him, and serve him. And today, we get to celebrate him. Amen? That's good news. That's the best news of the day. Is that the king came to see us. And one day, even though we don't see him physically, but know him, we'll get to stand face to face. And see all that he is in his glory. That's going to be a good day for us to look forward to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and thank you for this time to be reminded that, Lord, when the king comes, there are some challenges that happen that are a matter of the will and a matter of decision and a matter of whether we're going to be godly or just good. Were they going to be righteous or just right all the time? Whether we're going to be like our Lord or like ourselves. Lord, today as we celebrate your birth, just remind us how wonderful and magnificent it is. Your coming was planned out to every detail with all the ramifications of our salvation included. And one day we'll get to be with you. And as your children gather around your throne, we'll get to sing praises. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son on the cross. As you took up our sins upon yourself, 
in order that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. What a great gift for your bestowal. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.